important part of our um, of our overall requirements in terms of receiving these funds. If you have any questions, uh, Lillian and I are here to uh, assess. Madam Chair, some of the rates they look some of them look very high. Thirty-five percent, percent. Um, how do you explain that? It just doesn't uh, Lillian will go into detail a little bit, but uh, it is very much a function of our overhead costs. So things like our retirement costs, et cetera, are all being rolled into that. And um, Lillian will talk a little bit more about how that's generated. Um, basically what it is, it's costs over salaries. So in the last few years, because of the cutbacks, our salaries have gone down. So even if costs remain the same, our rates are going to go higher. So, for example, the light, when the lights are on, we take all the costs of the lights, we apportion them to the departments. It's based on uh, the denominator is the salary. So even if costs remain the same, when salaries go down, the rates are going to go up. So certain overhead costs are fairly constant or maybe increasing. And the way we calculate um, CAP applied is it's against the salary base. And so as overhead is constant or increasing and or salaries decreasing, uh, the rate of course is Some departments have lower, uh, such as CDD and housing, theirs are lower overall anyway because they pay a lot of costs directly. So those costs come out of their rate and it's not, a, it's not divided by their salaries. There's, that cost just doesn't exist there because it was paid by the feds in the first place. How does this compare to other cities? I mean, it, other cities have 82 percent. Yes, because uh, if if you look, for example, at the rates and you look at like LAPD and fire, their rates are relatively low because their salary base is so high. But generally, it's a, the smaller departments, um, such as El Pueblo, that have very low salary bases. And so, doesn't even if they're using X amount of space, they're still proportionally going to be higher. So in are those, those are the two main factors. I mean, salary, overhead. I mean, what about sort of programmatic expenses, or what is that? You know, if they're paying anything directly, that would be taken out. So if anything, they're almost artificially low. If you look at, like, if they're going to recharge their costs to anybody but the feds, like such as the state, their costs would actually be artificially low because because those costs are paid by the feds are not included. I didn't quite follow that. So sometimes the departments charge their services either to outside agencies or Caltrans and in that case a rate might be too low because we're, they're use, if they're using the cap and the, you know, we don't really get involved with the billing so they may be using a different billing system but generally because the feds paid those costs they were taken out so now they're not being apportioned to a different user so if anything they're actually paying a little bit lower rate. So if they're charging directly for certain costs, then they're taking that out of the overhead, basically, that they would charge somewhere else. Um, and in, in terms of the overall, I think if we were to flatten all of this, you would see a little bit lower overall rate. But because we're looking at rates by department, some of the, depart some of the smaller departments have uh, a higher portion over, you know, in terms of the overhead associated with those, with those smaller departments and kind of inflates uh, what the rate is for those, for those smaller departments. And I don't want to blame internal audit because they're sitting behind me, but they, we, we calculate their costs. So anytime they go into a department, the cost of that audit is charged to that department. And when it comes to a smaller department, such as El Pueblo, it's really going to make an impact. Even though it wasn't a really high cost of an audit, the audit wasn't really that expensive. It's because it's being applied to that base salary. And which is true for all of our central um, departments in terms of the apportionment of those costs. Now, the um, thing is that these are primarily being used for um, grant reimbursement purposes. Um, these also get used uh, at times for uh, billings or, or cost recovery uh, among departments. And uh, we do have the ability, and departments will also make adjustments um, to those rates uh, based on the particular billing. But for federal government uh, grant reimbursement purposes, um, these are the, uh, the accepted uh, rates of the federal government in terms of the methodology and the rates themselves. 
So the, these sort of rates haven't affected our ability to secure grants. I mean, they're not no. grants that have limits on the rates that we're missing out on, or no, not not from the federal uh, standpoint. Some, I know the feds do cap sometimes their administrative costs, but generally, what's gotten better in the last few years is now they come in. FEMA comes in ahead of time and they tell the rates that they're going to accept. They don't wait for the city to bill and then deny them, saying, "Oh, they're too high." So that's worked out a lot better. The feds are coming in now prior to actually the billing. So that's helped out a lot. So it is possible for certain grants that um, they won't accept the entire amount that uh, is due in terms of in terms of the overhead costs. They'll actually cap at a lower rate, be it 10% or something like that. And you said, and they've gotten a little higher recently because of the, the reductions. Uh, yes and no. It depends on the departments because we move things around. We've taken some costs out that the feds haven't been accepting. And then what happens, it can actually be kind of messed, I'd say we're messed up, but because we didn't, we overcharged because the rate was higher a couple of years ago, we have to what they call true up because we're always a couple of years behind because of the fiscal closing. So that can impact it where it then ends up, oh, you charge theoretically too much. So now you have a negative carry forward and that'll lower their rates. But it, it basically, it smooths out after, as Todd was saying, a period of a couple of years, it'll smooth out. So do we have a good apples to apples comparison of year over year or is it hard to get that? Uh, no, we do have uh, year to year uh, what the rates were uh, from the different cap, the different cap rates in the past meet any years really that we can compare year to year how they changed. But there are, like uh, Lillian was saying, there are modifiers in there such as because we do go back and true up the actuals to what was charged and then uh, basically take that difference and carry it forward to new years. Have any questions, Mr. Brown? No, it's uh, it's as clear as mud as always when we <laughs> deal with the cap rate. But what, one thing just remind me that the um, when we do re when we're getting reimbursed by grants, that in effect is aiding our general fund to receive these overhead costs. Yes. Okay. And so the key is is that so, so we get a grant for X number of dollars, but when we charge back, we're saying yeah we got the grant what we have used. Bureau of Engineering, we've used the CAO, we've used the city attorney, and we're getting these little pieces of money to compensate for all of that work effort for review and such. Now, where I disagree with for years, our cap rate is when we charge each other. And that, to me, seems that when we're asking general services to do something and you use the cap rate and charge them 80% when we already have them on the payroll, it's not like we're buying new people. That's where I think we've gone off the presentation. We're, we're basically overcharging uh, other entities, and I understand the legal part of it that they say you got to be consistent. But that just seems to defy logic that we give general services give another department a bill with those overhead costs when they're already being paid. They're already on the payroll. You're not if you are going to hire new people. That would be a totally different issue. But that's where I think sometimes, uh, particularly with Bureau of Engineering, we've had this dispute with them over time. Uh, they will cost you literally millions of dollars on the project before you have a groundbreaking because they keep collecting dollars for days and years and months. And then you say, well, how, how does it cost $2 million and we've not even gone out and uh, basically broken ground? And they will show you, well, I get a little bit of this and I get a little bit of that. And, the dilemma has always been, do you track that money with Bureau of Engineering to make sure it goes to the right project, or do they get the money in hand and use it on things they like to do? And that's always been a dilemma as it relates to those chart, those chargebacks. But and I don't quite know how to solve it, because every time we brought it up, the people on that side of the table are staring at me just like you are. <laughs> uh, but the, the issue is, is that just seems to be waste of our time and the loss of our revenue when city entities are charging other entities with a, with a rate when we've already paid it over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, it, you know, obviously, as you, as you mentioned, the cap rate is, is primarily in, in 
for the function of federal grant reimbursements, which is why we generate it and it does get used across the city uh, for various purposes. And, and I understand that, um, you know, having kind of a consistent methodology uh, for applying it across. We do have the ability, because of the way we put it together, to break out various individual components of the cap rates to be able to adjust it. And we have worked with departments in the past when they've asked for assistance in breaking it up. Uh, maybe there are certain things that uh, they want to charge for, um, but they, they realize that certain elements shouldn't be part of that charge, and, and they can certainly do that. Um, and and uh, we continue to, um, you know, occasionally also work with departments, um, you know, along those lines. Uh, and, and maybe there is a policy consideration there in terms of, um, you know, how departments uh, charge or are charged uh, in, according to cap rates. But you see, I think with the, the short fall of this has been leaving it to departments to decide often means they pick the easiest route, which is a formula you already created. So they're not willing to take on that responsibility and say, remove these elements out. Uh, because they say, well, it's already a formula. I'll just use the one you've been using for grant reimbursement. And so we keep that cycle going, and there's no consistency. If you have a diligent department that decides to do it differently, that's one thing. But in looking at the 35 or 40 departments, that isn't very routine. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, but that's where I think we hurt ourselves by overcharging ourselves when it's really intended for grant, grant reimbursement. I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever helps you think tonight. Whatever yeah. helps, that's right. <laughs> okay, I have no further questions. So thank you very much. There are no cards, right? Right. So we'd like, to, with no objection, we'd like to move that we know in the file side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go back to item three, if that's okay. We've read the item into the record. Correct. Um, I'd like to move to approve this motion with about a discussion for now. I would like for it to be referred to refer this item back to Plum to the Plum Committee with a recommendation for the report to come back in 30 days as directed by the motion. Madam Chair, may I add in terms of the report, uh, add the report to get a percentage of the overtime that's actually recovered uh, through fees and special services that are funded. I wanted to get that included and also a percentage of the overtime the general fund uh, that we use put those two things in. At some point, we can have the clerk record for the record uh, and get some answers from the department in terms of you know, um, some of the, the questions generally on the impact to the general fund. Um, that, would, that would be suffice for me to... Did you I, I think you may... Wanna, what do we have? I think the, one of the issues is the franchise fees or as far as the cost and how much of building and safety is based on uh, fees as opposed to general fund. Okay. The vast majority is fees because yeah. they have an enterprise fund. Yeah, enterprise. Uh, there is one issue with the motion that maybe we could correct here. Um, there have not been, or the two fiscal, in therefore number one, it says two fiscal quarters in the current fiscal year. But we just finished the first quarter of this fiscal year. So do you want to just say, the, should we just look at the past two fiscal quarters? Sure. OK. So let's fix that. The past two fiscal quarters. And I am told the representative from the department left uh, Big Plaza 20 minutes ago or 25 minutes ago, so I'm not sure why they're not here. But. It's fine. We're Could gonna you just take a moment, maybe explain to the com committee enterprise fund and how it differs from the general fund. Sure. So we, uh, an enterprise fund essentially is, you have special funds, you have enterprise funds. They're different. An enterprise fund is designed to pay for all costs associated with a given program. And so it's fully supported, full cost recovery. Uh, and it's, in this case, it's supported by fees from building permits. It's supposed to be a self-contained entity. If there's funding left at the end of the year, it returns to the fund because it represents 
uh, fees that have been paid for services that haven't yet been rendered if there's anything left over at the end of the year. So unlike a other, like the general fund, when there's money at the end of the year, it returns to the general fund and goes out of the department. Funds in the enterprise funds stay within the enterprise fund. And it's designed, like the airport is an inter essentially an enterprise fund. It's self-supporting, so there's no contribution from the general fund. With building and safety, the general fund funds enforcement. That is not funded through the, the no funding from the enterprise fund goes towards code enforcement. There is revenue from code enforcement that goes to the general fund, not the enterprise fund. So it's it's a self-contained. Is that yeah? That's what we do. For the rejection, I'd like to move the item. Yeah, and that item for clarification will uh, move forward to the Plum Committee uh, as amended. Thank you. Madam Clerk, can you please read item two into the record? And item number two is a controller report relative to the assessment of the city's minority, women, and other business enterprise contracting program. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Reese, Intern Auditor from Controller's Office. And Cynthia Varela with the Controller's Office. So we conducted an assessment of the city's minority women and other business enterprise contracting program. I'll refer to it as the meeting meeting. <laughs> uh, the report was issued June 6, 2012. The objective of the audit was to assess the city's oversight and the effectiveness of the Maybe Weeby and OB Enterprise Contracting Program, as as well as evalu to evaluate the impact on program effectiveness from any changes in the most re recent executive directive, which was issued in January 2011. The program was only in place for approximately seven months when the audit began. The audit also evaluated the processes used by sample city departments to ensure appropriate outreach efforts to Mibi Weebies were performed by prime contractors and departments while also monitoring the use of some contractors and contractors. Um, a little bit of background on the program. The city's Mibi Weebie OB um, contracting program has evolved over time and is currently called the Business Inclusion Program, also known as BIP. It was designed with the purpose of providing these types of firms an equal opportunity to participate in city contracts, benefiting not only the businesses, but the city by enhancing competition. The BIP requires all city departments and businesses wishing to contract with the city to utilize the city's automated system, which also allows businesses to view and download information about all bid opportunities offered by the city in one convenient location online. Businesses can also find up to date certified subcontractors complement. Based on our review of five departments, we found general compliance with the contracting outreach guidelines under the previous program. The departments had adequate procedures to ensure that prime contractors made the good faith outreach effort to reach out to disadvantaged businesses to include these firms as subcontractors. However, the fifth lab lacked strong centralized oversight and policy primarily focused on simply ensuring that outreach to all businesses, including disadvantaged businesses, has occurred, not that they were actually selected. Additional opportunities for improvement. <clears throat> um, we found that under Executive Directive 14, the program's effectiveness cannot be determined because the data collection methods were not standardized nor inconsistent. There were also um, no goals established under the previous program and the program's effectiveness is not adequately measured over time to determine whether outreach resulted in more participation in the contracts. Uh, efforts to demonstrate increased participation for these businesses was, was straight, strengthened under the BIP since there were stated goals and the reporting process has improved, but the program effectiveness still cannot be shown because data requirements were being developed at the time of the audit. Um, we also found deficient program processes cannot demonstrate increased participation in city contracts by disadvantaged, disadvantaged businesses. We found that although it is the city's overall intention to increase contracting opportunities to Mibi Weebies, efforts are actually limited by state prohibitions and potentially the city charter. State law, specifically Prop 209, prohibits preferential treatment on the basis of race. <clears throat> 
sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in public contracting. Um, during the audit, the mayor's office staff explained that jurisdictions are able to counter this prohibition if a disparity study dis demonstrates that disadvantaged businesses are underutilized or receive disproportionately fewer contracting dollars. However, the city has not conducted a disparity study. Mayoral staff also indicated that according to the city attorney's office, goals for small and disabled veteran business participation, which are considered race and gender neutral, cannot be imposed on general fund departments due to city charter requirements that are meant to ensure the pool of proposals is not lessened and that competition is not restricted. We also found that a significant amount of the city's contracting do dollars are not actually subject to the outreach requirements. While there may be a public perception that outreach must be performed for any city contracts, many contracts are actually exempt. For example, <clears throat> contracts with other public or quasi-public entities and nonprofit agencies are exempt from the requirement to perform outreach. <clears throat> Um, the program does not have a single point of authority for oversight, guidance, or monitoring. And this lack of centralized program administration led to other issues, such as confusion among departments regarding the correct proposed subcontracting documents to be used during the solicitation process, and the mandated use of an underfunded information system tool, FAVIN, which automate, automates much of the city's contract solicitation process. The same tool, um, let's see, FAVIN, the data on it is, does not appear to be accurate. Uh, contractor data in the system should be accurate so stakeholders can rely on the reports regarding the number of contractors, subcontractors, and their certification status. <clears throat> but based on a report of all firms in, in the system as of January 2012, we found what appeared to be duplicate entries for the same firms or the same firm listed multiple times. Under the previous executive directive, Contracts awarded to prime contractors do not include disadvantaged subcontractors as initially proposed. While departments ensured that prime, co prime contractors complied with the outreach requirements, we found instances in which the prime contractors were including subcontractors in their proposals, but they were not actually reflected in the final contract, and they were not used in the performance of the contracted work. And finally, we found that there were excessive waiver requests under the previous executive director, uh, which contributed to program ineffectiveness. Uh, the previous program did not explicitly state which uh, circumstances a waiver could be granted. However, departments were allowed to submit waiver requests for contracts if they believe they should not be subject to the contractor requirements. Uh, um, it appeared that the number of waiver requests decreased since 2008 based on data that was provided by the mayor's office, but uh, still a significant amount of contracts were exempt from the outreach process. For example, we reviewed a sample of 32 waiver requests in fiscal year 0910 and found that more than half of the waivers were approved with, and the total dollar amount associated was approximately $93 million or 76% of all the waivers. The report contained 13 recommendations and as of October 2012, Nine were implemented, three were in progress, and one was not implemented. We requested a status update on the outstanding, recommenda outstanding recommendations on May 16, 2013, but did not receive response from the mayor's office. Yeah, I was just going to ask a question on the status of the four outstanding recommendations. In terms of uh, number 12, has the compliance unit been established in the mayor's office yet? Uh, there was the uh, minority business, I can't remember the name of it, development office, I think. They were in charge of it initially, but I'm not sure what's happened since the change of the administration. Yeah, that was one, that was the one recommendation yeah. that had not been implemented yeah. yet. Right, and so. that's what, maybe it was because we were right, you know, we're about to turn over administration, so I don't know if, but is that something we can follow up with the mayor's office? That compliance unit, I think, is important. We, our process is to follow up on our recommendations about every six months, so we're at about that point. To give him, yeah, and he just, mm -hmm. he just started, right. so, in all fairness. But that would be a, a good one to make sure it gets implemented. Um, and I have a couple of other ones. Did the controller office contact them? Maybe we be certified businesses to assess if the programs, if the program was, is, was effective? Or... 
No, no, we didn't. No, that wasn't part of the audit scope. We were looking more at the internal processes to see um, the metrics that they were setting up and then how they complied with it. Hi. Hi. Um, Angela Mota from Mayor Garcetti's office. Oh, great. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. Yes. Um, and you're right. We are uh, going through a transition and turning over staff. So we have been reviewing the audit and the program, making some changes and including some of the things that had been in, uh, asked in the audit. So it's a work in progress, um, but we are aware of the, the elements that still needed to be implemented and then um, tweaking the things that were already implemented to work within our, uh, our vision of how we'll be moving forward. All right. Well, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for addressing that. I appreciate it. Um, do you have any... Any questions, Mr. Blumenfield? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I was, I was pretty actually amazed that we don't have this, that this data is not there right now. And I mean, it's, um, it's good the mayor's office, and I have every confidence they're going to be working on it and they're committed to it. Um, but it was also a little shocking that we mm -hmm. didn't have it already. And, and I was wondering about how we can change it to make sure that that happens in terms of maybe technology. You mentioned the BAVN program. Um, how do we modify that so that we actually collect the data that we need so that this doesn't become an issue in the future? In terms of just being able to, you know, let alone where, whether the metrics are being achieved, but just being able to measure the metrics um, is sort of the step one. And if we can't do that, how can we even hope to get to step two? Um, I've been working with the uh, Bureau of Contract Administration and some of the other departments that are involved in contracts and identifying some of the areas that need to be improved to collect the data and to get a more accurate um, idea of how effective the program is. So that is, those are the things that we're looking at right now as we're going forward. Well, great. And certainly, as far as the, the ITGS committee, if there's a way we can get the ITA to work on that, make sure that you have the technology that you need to make it happen. Okay. Our website is uh, also going through transition. Um, it had been a third party website through LA Works, uh, which is where the um, reports were being posted. We're doing away with that website probably. We're still figuring out what we're going to do with it, but um, there will be a link on the mayor's website to um, get the information. Uh, the technology is there to be able to do it. We have um, a really great uh, person in ITA who has created the Bobbin system, um, but the direction from the mayor's office and from the departments that utilize the, the technology are going to make it better in the future. And do we know, are, are, do other cities have the same problem of not, not even have, being able to measure? Or is this, are there good examples of other cities that have done this effectively? Do we, do we sort of stand out like a sore thumb on this? I believe that the Bobbin system has been awarded, um, has been recognized as a leading system. So I think we're probably ahead of the curve. Um, as compared to other cities, but I haven't done a lot of research into uh, what other cities are doing right now. But the, the system has been recognized as um, as a leader in technology. Does the Oversight Procurement, procurement um, Oversight Committee report back to the council, or how is it set up? Do you know? I don't know. Just in curious about the outcomes. I believe it was the mayor's previous staff that oversaw the committees, so I'm not, they weren't even really meeting that frequently at the time of the audit, so I, I well, don't there, know. There go the outcomes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the committee. We haven't met as a committee recently at all. Mr. Parks, do you have any questions? You know, I, I, I was kind of surprised when I read the audit uh, because in reading it, it's uh, almost verbatim when you talk to contractors, wow. what they believe is occurring. And, and when you think this program has been in place since 1983, and we're saying today we do not have the information to evaluate it, and we find, and it's always been a shortcoming on um, dealing with contractors, subcontractors have never been given the supervision that they should. And even though the prime contractors, we oversee them they often are the smallest number of people that you're dealing with. And so the bulk of the money is being spent with subcontractors. And historically, we've heard contractors say, yeah, they bring me in, 
they put me as part of the package, they get approved, and then they tell me to go away. And we, for so years, said nobody would do that. Uh, and this is something that it's kind of horrendous if we're saying, on the one hand, that we're um, kind of uh, community or business oriented. And then in the middle of the report, when we see that Bureau of Engineering has an optimal, optimal program that no one's imposing on the rest of the cities they implement. And a couple of years ago, LADWP had an unbelievable program, but because they got into an argument with the developer, they dismantled it. I mean, so either we are going to cause these things to occur or we should tell people we don't have a program. Because when you spend 70-something percent of the money and somebody could bypass it by waivers, but we don't keep track of the waivers, so we don't know who's getting them and what. I mean, I mean, I, this is something that I was amazed when I read it. And, and the fact that, that we could be doing something this poorly and then it's, and, it's, and the fact that it's decentralized amongst a bunch of people, what we've found in the past, no one takes responsibility for it. Everybody walks up to the edge and says, well, I do A, but I don't do A plus one. So-and-so says, well, I do B. And so we end up, the public doesn't get served, and we assume something's happening, and we find out later it's not. And, and, and since 83, that's a long time to be thinking something's happening, and minorities and females are getting some shot. Uh, the one thing, uh, only question I have is that when we talk about our inability to impose uh, the numbers on, on contractors, don't, I thought a while back we came up with a solution that if you impose local hire, although it's not ideal, you at least have an opportunity to ensure that people in the local community are getting uh, some kind of attention without violating 209. And it seems like even local hire kind of disappeared in any of this, these operations. And, 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 you know, one of the things we found when I was on the, MT, uh, the uh, Expo line, the prime contractor got wonderful reports, but they never imposed themselves on the subs. And what we found is that the subs were hiring people out of state because their goal was to keep their union members hired. They had little regard for local people being hired. And so that's just something, and they would they would do this perfunctory deal of making a local person a flagman, and when the job left, they stayed there with their flag and didn't continue to be hired, because the only people that got hired were the journeymen and things like that. And so I would hope that uh, that in addition, maybe we could make a recommendation. In addition to these recommendations, it would appear to me that we need somebody that the council can depend on. That's kind of making all these pieces mesh, and maybe we could ask the CLA to take on the responsibility to look at all these uh, pieces and to evaluate how we can better handle them. And if there's a conflict with state or federal law, we should either alter our program to match it or we should stop telling people we're doing it. But we need somebody that's going to pull it together and say, here's how you fix a, B, C, and D, and then here's the better program. I just don't think you're going to get all these departments to wake up one day and say, okay, I fixed mine. And, and and for us to be wandering around since 83 and saying, well, the conflicts with the state law, well, did anybody think how we should maybe have altered the program? That's the thing that makes you wonder if we're paying attention. But I would just ask that maybe we consider asking the CLA to look at this program in general and come back to us with what could be recommendations that have accountability and an understanding of the ultimate goals. Or else we should just say, let's not do this anymore. And it just takes a whole chapter out of the administrative code and we don't have to come back with audits like this. I think um, in response to the uh, restrictions from the state code, the audit does discuss uh, potentially administering a disparity study, which would be costly, but it would be, it could help them. But we've, heard, we've had that story about disparity studies on almost everything we come up with. It's almost like a throwaway line that says we're not going to do anything. When 209 came in and they said do your best effort, mm -hmm. in most instances it means no effort. And so that's, w that's why it dissipates, and so therefore contractors don't want this extra requir requirement or responsibility. And if you have an in-house person that's waiving, then there's no program. So, I mean, so, so the 
previous administration talking about disparity um, studies is, is one of the recommendations. I'm not sure where the new administration is at in that regard, but the previous administration ha had also convened a working group. Do we know what the outcomes were as a result of them meeting? There must have been a list of things that were recommended to improve the program as well. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at that or if uh, some of the, the outcomes the, exist. Some of the outcomes or some of the um, the recommendations that were implemented uh, were to post the um, outreach requirements on the website, uh, which is the website that's kind of in flux right now. Um, the other part that was implemented was with the waivers, uh, keeping track of those waivers. And I'm not sure um, how those waivers were scrutinized, but um, as they had, had reported that the um, waivers had gone down. So they were keeping track of the waivers. I'm not sure how they were deciding which waivers were approved and not, but um, there was a system in place to uh, review those. And um, our administration has discussed uh, looking at a disparity study, but again, we're early on um, and forming our um, strategy, and uh, so we haven't made a determination about how that will be handled. But it is something that we've we've thought about and that we're considering um, looking at. And I think one of the things most of us could figure this disparity without a study. <laughs> All you got to do is talk to the people who do business. You have, the data. Yeah, you have the data to back it up. And, and, <laughs> and the other side is having a disparity study with a bunch of recommendations that you don't implement, just as we're not implementing our own rules, mm -hmm. this puts the disparity study next to our rules, and we just brush them off, and, and then we keep you busy by auditing them. <laughs> and you probably could have come up with a conclusion on the audit before you started. <laughs> Well, just I'm sort of adding say, but we, we don't need a disparity study if we actually had really good data. It would just be a matter of pulling it up. And that was the alternative that was suggested by the then mayor's administration, is rather than spend the money on another disparity study or participate in one and pay for that, is that they would collect the data and then use that as a basis for saying whether certain groups were being underutilized. And there were, there, were, there were flaws in the data and the way it was collected, but to the previous administration's credit, it was slowly improving. Um, so they started a template, at least. Okay. So if there's no further questions, I'd like to move that we note and file the controller's report. Thank you very much for coming. Are there no more items? There are no other items before the committee. So that concludes our agenda for today. I'd like to move that we conclude the audits committee and adjourn. <laughs>